here's Sherman and Burleigh. Our Bob Moore is there. He's live with the latest on this. Bob. The accident scene I'm about to show you right now is about four hours old. You see this scene, it's improved since we reported to you at five. The school bus that was involved in this has now been moved north of the intersection of Burleigh and Sherman Boulevard. And as they see accident reconstruction folks are still taking measurements at this scene. And within the hour, Milwaukee police confirmed that the driver of this red SUV died. Now we're not sure how it happened, but he lost control of the vehicle, headed southbound on this stretch of roadway going into cars. One eyewitness who ironically was in a funeral procession, got a flat tire, came to the BP station at this intersection and was on hand to tell us what she described as an accident that looked like dominoes falling one by one. The next one. thing you know, you just start hearing all this loud noise and we look over and the red truck was going through um, and he was going about 50, 60 miles per hour it looked like. And uh, he, the cars, they were just hitting. It was like something you see out of an action movie. And he, the last thing that he hit was the school bus, and he ended up over that way. Um, when one of the police officers asked us if we seen what happened, he said that he believed the driver had a, uh, was having a heart attack while driving. It was a lot of vehicles. It, it shocked me when I seen how many cars it was, and then seeing that all the cars were damaged and it seemed like somebody was hurt out of each vehicle. And again, you're looking at a live scene right here. This a roadway has been closed since 238. It appears that any traffic is not going to get here for several hours more. We do want to report that driver is dead. We don't know how. Milwaukee police say they're waiting until an autopsy is completed. Now, there were four medical transport, one person on the school bus, three drivers, one in each of the vehicles. They are believed not to have life-threatening injuries. We're here live at Sherman and Burleigh. Bob Moore, Fox 6 News. Half those pictures in that photo we show you saw, I took those. Those are days that I took Sarah and Claire somewhere together as a family. And I blame myself absolutely for everything that's happened. Um, that's because of me that's so the that Sarah's no longer here. Benjamin Germano's attorney called it a case of self-defense, and he asked for seven to nine years and long supervision for the strangulation murder of Sarah Rocio. Instead, the judge gave him 25 years in prison and 15 years supervision. That's what Rocio's mother asked the judge to give Germano. He watched, he watched six inches from her face. He watched and tormented her until he took every last ounce of air from her. He had choices. He doesn't deserve to have a reduced sentence. He deserves a maximum sentence for the crime. Both sides committed. of the family told the judge the real loser is the young daughter that both individuals leave behind. Father in prison and the mother deceased. We're live outside the Milwaukee County Courthouse Plaza. Bob Moore, Fox 6 News. That sentencing was very emotional. Bob, thanks. Tonight, for the first time, we are hearing from the family of a local army specialist killed in Afghanistan Sunday. Just hours after his death, his family got the dreaded knock on the door. Today, they talked about that very moment exclusively with our Bob Moore and also shared some wonderful memories. Bob. Well, and that Sunday evening knock, Nagorski's parents did what thousands of American families have had to do. Well, the carafe stood proud as they watched the flag-draped casket of their son return home at Dover Air Force Base in Delaware. Now, today, they celebrated his life. Army Specialist Scott Nagorski turned 27 years old last Saturday, November 13th. 24 hours later, enemy fighters shot and killed Nagorski and four fellow soldiers in Afghanistan. I salute him 100%. He was a great guy. That he was so caring and so strong and didn't find faults in people. He found the good in everybody. Scott Karev says a visitor to his home Sunday at 1110 could only mean one thing. I knew before I opened the door it's when your son is in Afghanistan and you have the military standing outside your door in Class A uniforms, it's not going to be good. I'm sad that he's gone, but if it wasn't for guys like Scott, we wouldn't be sitting here having an interview. This is land of the free because of Specialist Scott Nagorski and everybody else in this military. 
What will you remember most about your brother? Oh, his smile, his jokes. He was such a goofball. He was just always funny, just hilarious, you know? He made everybody laugh. Nicole Jasinski says through Nagorski's good nature, he was an older brother who kept her safe long before he became a soldier. We were very close growing up. He was like, even probably as a kid, he was my hero. It's hard. I do miss him. I always did miss him while he was over there. It's going to be hard. Well, as the Correa family spoke to me Friday, it was also the first birthday of the Gorski's only child, Melody. And again, at this point, it's a real difficult one. He survived by, again, his wife, Nadine, who is still in Clarksville, Tennessee, and she will soon return back here, where she's from, to have their daughter raised by both sides of the family. It's funny, I read your story before it aired, but mm -hmm. seeing them say that, especially the sister saying how he was always a big brother and she'll always miss him. Mm -hmm. That just it touches you. Funny, but a protector. Yeah. Bob, thank you so much for getting Wisconsin's 2010 primary is four days away, and it is win or lose weekend for Democratic and Republican candidates who are trying to energize voters to show up on Tuesday. Now, since it's a primary, you have to declare a party preference. Our Bob Moore looks at whether voters might cross over political lines to support a candidate they hope will then lose in November. Wisconsin's Government Accountability Board predicts voter turnout in Tuesday's 2010 primary could meet or exceed 30 percent, unlike the general election where all the candidates are listed on a single ballot. On Tuesday, the voter will have to make a choice. On the primary day, you can only vote in one party's primary. You can't vote in both parties' primaries even it's, if it's for a different office. UWM political scientist Mordecai Lee points out two races Tuesday he calls sexy, high-profile primaries where voters might like to split their votes. I like the fact that you can only vote in one party's primary, but Wisconsinites just hate it. You have to take a Republican ballot to vote for either Scott Walker or Mark Newman for governor, or take a Democratic ballot to vote for the perceived conservative incumbent David Clark or Chris Mays for Milwaukee County Sheriff. I think malicious voting in Wisconsin is an urban myth. The urban myth Lee's referring to is a diehard Democratic or Republican voter Tuesday requesting a ballot for the other team. Does somebody go to the trouble of voting and then once they walk into the booth, do they really say, I want to throw my vote away? In Wisconsin, both political parties downplay the threat of the crossover voter. I don't think it's a factor at all. I think Democrats are going to vote for Tom Barrett. I think uh, this idea of crossover voting, the only reason we're having that discussion is because Scott Walker's campaign is exploding in front of our eyes. Well, I don't think it's going to be problematic at all for, for Scott Walker or Ron Johnson. I think that uh, Republican voters are going to stay in the Republican primary and Democrats will stay in the Democratic primary. Bottom line, at the state party level, both sides say their own primary stakes are just too high to bother with an organized crossover effort. Every Republican voter is needed to decide a narrowing race between Scott Walker and Mark Newman. And the Democrats say they want every diehard Dem to vote against incumbent David Clark. The party has thrown their support to Chris Mays. Live in the newsroom, Bob Moore, Fox 6 News. I know we'll be chewing on this topic again on Tuesday. Thank you, Bob. Just hours ago, hundreds of people showed up at a Muskego Middle School to say goodbye to 11-year-old Evan Cobal. The sixth grader suffered a concussion during a football game a week ago, and then last Friday, he hit his head again. Sunday, he died. Our Bob Moore is in Muskego tonight, Bob. Well, you know something, Evan Koble died at 7.44 Sunday evening. By the time school started Tuesday morning at 8 a.m., administrators knew they had a very difficult day ahead. Fox 6 News was invited to a flower laying service. It started at 3 o'clock, and now you see it's continuing as Evan's own team, the Muskegon Junior Warriors, begin practice. The school year at Bay Lane Middle School in Muskego is not yet a week old. Recently talking to his father, we estimated that Evan lived 30 years in the 11 years of going sledding, of going swimming, 
of wearing big goofy glasses. Uh, you can't do that sitting at home. This is the scene at 3 p.m. Tuesday. School's out as hundreds of students, teachers, and parents gathered around the football sleds where Evan Coble injured his head last Friday. That happened at recess here at school with the kids horsing around, um, and it was a tragic accident. Um, in no way did it happen during football time. The outpouring of emotions by students Coble's own age was a time, according to Coach Benny Lewis, a teaching moment. They have to understand that any of us, when we go, it is God's will. So uh, I'm pretty sure they will be okay after a while. If they keep their head up, they will be. Well, you're looking at the jersey that Evan actually wore last year. I got it from the coach. He says he's plans to use this jersey and put it on the bench during the season to let his teammates know that Evan was a standout kind of player. Within the hour, I did speak with Evan's parents, and uh, they tell me they're struggling right now for funeral expenses. So the school has taken the initiative to establish an Evan Colbo Memorial Fund. And if you'd like to contribute and help the family, that can be done at any U.S. bank. We're live here on a very somber practice field in Muskego. Bob Moore, Fox 6 News. It won't be there for long. The street in Horicon is lined in gold. Yeah, this mild dry weather has led to a mountain of corn. Our Bob Moore shows you the spectacular scene. Never in my life have I seen that much corn. It's really something to see. Ron Oryx lived in Horicon since 1950. I knew that they were going to have a big corn crop this year because of the weather we had. Horicon in Dodge County is a city of 4,400 people and no grocery store. Everybody was kind of talking it over. Where are they going to put the corn? Well, you see where it is now. Since the middle of October, Horicon residents have watched an ever-growing mountain of field corn. Not edible. It's, it just seems like it's a regular circus. It was semi, 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 semi. That's what it was. Well, some people guessed that it was a one and a half million bushels of corn, and but that's a lot of corn. A lot of corn is right. So much so, there's no room in the milling company storage silos or drying bins. That's why you got your corn pile. They can't handle it fast enough. It's an impressive sight. In this driving shot along Van Brunt Drive, we traveled more than a quarter of a mile and nothing but gold. This mountain of maize is tailor made for me to take a video clip for the history books, if you will. It's courtesy of 45 days of warm and dry weather. In October alone, it was three and a half degrees warmer than normal, and we had an inch less rain than we normally get. So far in November, that weather pattern continued. And when it's wet, you just can't harvest it. You can't do it. nothing, right? It just rots on you. Not the case for the 2010 corn harvest. In Horicon, Bob Moore, Fox 6 News. Now, you may be asking yourself, uh, won't the corn get a little moldy there, especially if it sits out in the rain? We're told once the corn mountains are removed, any moldy corn at the bottom will be sold to make ethanol, so nothing goes to waste. Well, that's good. Yeah.